Don't you love this portion of Isaiah? Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. I have been so comforted to have a man that can come alongside me and teach with me precepts for life and have the audience be blessed. Enjoy our son, David Arthur. He has a master's in theological studies from Reform Seminary, and he is a man who loves the word and loves teaching you. If given the option to be completely in control of your life, absolute sovereign control, all details placed in your hand and under your authority, would you take it? Honestly, would you really want to rest in your own power and your own strength to run your life? We're going to see today what happens when man decides to be his own God, to take his own destiny into his own hands, making himself supreme authority. Hi, my name is David Arthur, and I'm so glad you're here with me today to study God's Word, to see what He has to say about what does it mean when we decide not to follow Him. So we have some really strict warnings here in Isaiah 57. He sums it up at the end of the chapter in verse 21. He makes it very clear. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Seem harsh to you? Does it seem like God is drawing the line too severely when there is no peace for the wicked? Let's look and see how he describes the wicked and how he describes what they're up to in chapter 57. It actually begins in chapter 56, verse 9. Hear what he says. All you beasts of the field, all you beasts of the forest, come to eat. Here he gives an open invitation to the beast to come and devour these whom he describes. Verse 10. His watchmen, speaking of Israel, his watchmen are blind. All of them know nothing. All of them are mute dogs, unable to bark. Dreamers lying down who love to slumber. And the dogs are greedy and they are not satisfied. And they are shepherds who have no understanding. They have all turned to their own way, each one to his unjust gain, to the last one. Come, they say, let us get wine and let us drink heavily of strong drink, and tomorrow will be like today, only more so. What is he saying here about these people? Well, did you note there in verse 11 how he described them? He says, they have all turned to their own way. Interesting, isn't it? In chapter 50, 53, in chapter 53, verse 6, he says, all of us have turned to his own way. And, but the Lord has caused iniquity of us all. They're describing us as sheep who have wandered away, have gone astray. But here he is using the pronoun they. He's making a distinction. They have gone astray. Well, how have they gone astray? Well, it goes on in 57 to tell us. It says in verse 3, You sons of a sorceress, offspring of an adulterer and a prostitute, against whom... Do you jest? And against whom do you open your wide your mouth and stick out your tongue? Are you not children of rebellion, offspring of deceit? Now, in verse 5, he tells us their activities, what they're about. Here's the first one. Who inflame yourselves among the oaks under every luxuriant tree. Here we have the connotation of sex being used as a form of worship. Sex used as worship? What does that mean? We study the religions of this time of when Isaiah was written, and we find out that the pagan religions would require the people to come to their temple or their house of worship, and they would engage in lewd activity and sexual activity in order to stimulate what they thought were the gods above watching them. You see, that what they thought it was their role to somehow manipulate or to stimulate 
the various gods up in the heavens above them, and then those gods would then mimic what man was doing down in the worship house. They would begin to have uh, relations up there, and the result, the fruit of it would be fertility in the women here on earth. The, the, the result would be fertility in their crops. They would have bountiful crops that season. Isn't that backwards? Somehow, I, I can't understand how we would think that somehow it's my job to manipulate my deity, those whom I claim to be my God, to do things that would then benefit me. If you think about that rationally for a moment, it seems to flip the roles. It seems to make God man and man God. So that the one who's really in charge is man. Let's go on to see what else. Uh, in 57 verse 6, excuse me, in 57 uh, verse 5, it says, under the, uh, under the oaks, there you were, but he says, who slaughter the children in the ravines under the clefts of the crags. What does this mean, slaughter the children? They had a practice that they would do. Uh, it's later referred to here in Molech, but they would have a practice they would do, and they would build this, this statue, a little bit larger than a man, and he would be a straight standing statue with his two arms coming out from his body in a 90 degree angle at his waist. And then below the, the hands would be a basin of which they would then build a fire. And these people, in order to please or appease the gods above that they worshipped, they would take their own children and they would, as a form of worship, place their children in the arms of this pagan demonic god, Molech, and they would watch their children burn to death. Now, this wasn't done because some ruler had come along and said, listen, I'm a crazy dictator. This is what we're going to do. If you're going to follow me, you have to slaughter your children. No, this was something that they believed in, that they willingly engaged in. They thought, if I would sacrifice one of my children, then Molech, in return, his part of the transaction would be to give me back many more sons. That's syncretism. That's blending religions. And what happens is when you blend a religion with something demonic, that all of it becomes tainted. I wonder if they realized at the end of the day that they were, they were slaughtering their children. That they were taking humans and placing them in the, and literally in the hands of a, of a pagan deity and sacrificing them and slaughtering them. It goes on in verse 6 to tell us some other activities of the wicked. Verse 6 says, Among the smooth stones of the ravine is your portion. They are your lot. Even to them you have poured out a drink offering. You have made a grain offering. Shall I relent concerning these things? Now these smooth stones that are referred to here in the text are these phallic symbols, these symbols of sexual organs that they would build all over their city. You see, their culture had become consumed with this pagan worship. So that worship became a place of, of sexual pleasure. It became a place of um, sacrificing your children, of somehow trying to, to stimulate or manipulate the gods above. And here in verse 6, it says, You bring your offerings, you bring your, you bring your drink offerings, your grain offerings, and you lay them out before these statutes of sexual organs. This is the extent to what happens when the people of God begin to bring in ideas of worship from their surrounding culture and try to blend it in with the worship of Yahweh. That wasn't strange to those around them. To those around them, multiple gods was the norm. Sure, you can have Yahweh. You can bring Yahweh into the mix. Sure, we can, we can build a whole bunch of deities around here. But what we've read all throughout Isaiah up to this point is God demands exclusive, exclusive soul rights to your life. He says over and over again, I am God and there is no other besides me. So we have the people. Uh, it, it goes on in verse 7. It says, Upon a high and lofty mountain you have made your bed. You also went up there to offer sacrifice. 
Behind the door and the doorpost, you have set up your sign. Indeed, far removed from me, you have uncovered yourself. And I've gone up and made your bed wide, and you have made an agreement for yourself with them. You have loved their bed. You have looked on their manhood. In verse 9, you have journeyed to the king with oil and increased your perfumes. You have sent your envoys a great distance and made them go down to Sheol. Here they're seeking the help of foreign kings. This is often what Israel would do when they got in trouble. Instead of going to God, they would go to those things which were around them. But they're simply doing what their neighbors would do. I mean, you can see them. They're sitting on the front porch of their little house there uh, in in Israel. And they're saying, hey, what do you do when you're in, in a tough circumstance? These people begin to adopt the ways of the world around them. And the ways of the world around them were horrible. It, it, they, they thought of life as something to be, to be used in a deal, in a transaction. That it was uh, much the way in what modern world thinks about abortion. It's just, you know, I don't want to have a baby now. It's, it's just inconvenient. I'm working on my career. I'll end this life now. Or they would see the, their, their sexuality to be something to be distributed among whomever they wished and whenever they wished. The world around them had infiltrated the hearts and the minds of the people. And it says, for the wicked, there is no peace. Is that harsh? Is that unfair? God has already told us in his text here in Isaiah that his ways are simply not our ways that His thoughts are simply not our thoughts. And so if we are going to be included into His people, if we are going to join ourselves to Him, that literally means we must forsake those ways, that we must set them aside and walk away from them, rejecting their call to our lives. We must look at them for what they really are. I mean, let's examine it. These are things, this is a mentality that says, I am in control of my destiny. That I'm even in control of those things of which I worship. And yes, though I bow the knee, in reality, my friend, is it not true that they were gods unto themselves? There is no peace for the wicked, for those who decide to reject God and His authority. Welcome back. Glad you're joining me in this study of Isaiah, understanding who God really is and His perspective on those who wish to join Him to be His people. If you'd like more help, I'd like to invite you to go to preceptsforlife.com. There you'll find a free download. It's a study guide designed to enhance your study of this text as you study along with us here at Precepts for Life. Also, I would love it if you would let us know, how's it working for you? Now let's look as we continue in chapter 57 and verse 11. He says this, Of whom were you worried and fearful when you lied and did not remember me, nor give me a thought? Was I not silent even for a long time, so you do not fear me? God says then, I will declare your righteousness and your deeds, but they will not profit you. That's how he finishes up that aspect of who the wicked are. It comes up, when you add it up, it comes out to be a negative, to be a zero. But look at verse 13. 13 kind of wraps it up for us. When you cry out, he says, let your collection of idols deliver you. In other words, if you're going to follow this way of living, if you're going to allow the world to determine who you're going to worship, he says, then when you cry out, don't cry to me. Cry to those things that you want to worship. Cry out to your collection of idols. And in verse 13, let them deliver you. But he says, this is what will happen. The wind will carry all of them up and a breath will take them away. My friend, this is, this is true wisdom from God. He's saying, look, just evaluate what you're investing in. Evaluate how you're making your decisions and what you're deciding to give your loyalty, your affection, your devotion to, and just compare it to me. The wind, he says, will take those collection of idols 
I mean, can't you see it as kind of like a little thing on a shelf? This little collection of idols, is that what you're going to cry out to? Because if you are, when the wind comes, when the storms and the trials of life come, they will simply blow them away. But then he gives us hope. At the end of verse 13, he says this, But he who takes refuge in me will inherit the land and will possess my holy mountain. There it is, a hope of promise. But instead, in contrast, if he who takes his refuge in me, he says, I will place them in my, in my land. I will place them in my holy mountain and give them possession. Now, verses 14 to the end of the chapter give us hope for this way that is being built for His people. It gives us hope for those who will follow God. It says in verse 14, Build up and prepare the way. Remove every obstacle out of the way of my people. For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, I dwell on a high and holy place. And also with the contrite and lowly of spirit in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. He who dwells in the highest of the heavens is willing to stoop down to the lowest of the low. He who sits on the throne of the universe is willing to step off and to come to you one-on-one and meet you in your lowly spirit, to minister to the contrite. And he says, I want you to build up. I want you to prepare a way. It reminds me of chapter 40, the opening paragraph of chapter 40, of this building this highway of which the comfort of the Lord will come. Build up the highway, prepare the way, and remove the obstacles. He then says in verse 16, For I will not contend forever, nor will I always be angry. There he's saying, listen, there's going to come an end to my discipline and my wrath on my people. He goes on to describe it. He says, because in verse 17, of the iniquity of his unjust gain, I was angry and I struck him. I hid my face and was angry. And he went on turning away in the way of his heart. In my discipline, God is saying. Now, God doesn't lose his temper. God doesn't, is not like us where he flares up. But God in His wrath pursued them. They kept turning on their way. They kept running from Him. But verse 18 has these words to say. I have seen His ways, but I will heal Him. I've seen where He's going. I've seen the path of destruction that He has decided to place His life upon. I've seen Israel as they have run from my covenants and my promises and my precepts and my provision and my protection. I've seen them run from my grasp. But I will heal Him. Look what it says in 18. I will lead Him and restore comfort to Him and to His mourners. What would that look like? It's like a child running away from you. And you know the further they run, the more danger they'll get into. They're they're running in in such a way that they're going to crash or hurt themselves. And you're calling out to them to stop. But here we have the sovereign God who is able to do anything. And He says, I have seen His ways, but I will heal Him. I will lead him in comfort. I will restore him. I will bring him back and I will bring him and lead him to restoration. Now, what does that look like? In verse 19, it tells us, I will be creating, he says, the praise of the lips. I love that. Creating. Creating is something we, that God does. Only God can create. It's something where he takes nothing and he makes something. He takes something that doesn't exist, and He makes something that does exist. What's He creating here in verse 19? He says, I'm creating the praise of His lips. It reminds me of of the chapters that we've already looked at where He told the people to shout or to sing for joy, O barren ones. You see, God's restoration is is literally going to create praise on the lips of His people. Why? Because He has healed them. He has restored them. He has made them His own. And look what He says. Peace, peace to Him who is far and to Him who is near, says the Lord, and I will heal Him. 
But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up refuse and mud, and there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Did you notice how he describes those whom he will bring peace? Verse 19, to him who is far and to him who is near. My friend, we now know because we have the entire Word of God uh, now in our hands. And we can go look and see what the end of the story is. And I invite you to go sometime to the book of Ephesians in chapter 2. And there what Paul is doing for us, he's describing how those who were once far off, those who were removed, will be brought back to Him. It says in Ephesians 2 verse 17, It says that it is through the blood of Jesus Christ. The suffering servant of Isaiah 53. The Messiah, the one promised, the one who will come and lead his people back to his father. Back to the heavenly father in their covenants and the covenant of peace and restoration was done through the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as he was pinned to that tree on Calvary. And though he knew no sin, and though he had never done anything wrong, he made a sacrifice once and for all, a sacrifice of his own body, his own blood, and his own righteousness. And this, according to Isaiah, Isaiah says this, it is peace to him who is far and to him who is who is near. Peace. It's shalom. It's God's intended position and place. It's His presence with His people. Peace is brought those, peace is brought from those who are far away to you who may be near. Do you know His peace? In our text today in Isaiah 57, verse 19, we read this. Creating the praise of the lips, here's the message. Peace, peace to him who is far and to him who is near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. 2,000 plus years later, this message is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Paul writes about it in his letter to the Ephesians in chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember. And here he's going to describe the situation of the Gentiles. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in this world. That's a description before Jesus Christ. That was the case for the Gentiles. But verse 13, it changes. Listen to how he describes the change in verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself, Jesus, is our peace. He goes on to say in verse 16 that Jesus reconciled them both into one body to God through the cross and by having it put to death the enmity. Then in verse 17, he quotes our text for today, Isaiah 57, verse 19. Verse 17 says, And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through Him we both have access in one Spirit to the Father. Here's the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 57 verse 19. It is in Jesus Himself. It says Jesus is the one who brought us from being strangers, who brought us from being you know, outside, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, not having access to the covenants having no hope and being without God, it says it is through Jesus, but not just through Jesus. It is through the cross of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. That is what brings us near to God. 
for those who were excluded, for those who were far off, have now, through the blood of Jesus Christ, have been brought near. This is the gospel, my friend. The gospel tells us that there's a way that those who were once outside can now be a part of the family. And it is only through Jesus Christ himself. Thank you for watching today. To download your free copy of the study guide or to find out more about Precept Ministries International, click on our website or call us today at 1-800-763-1990. Join us for our next program as we discover more Precepts for Life. For those who were excluded, for those who were far off, have now, through the blood of Jesus Christ, have been brought near. This is the gospel, my friend. The gospel tells us that there's a way that those who were once outside can now be a part of the family. And it is only through Jesus Christ himself. Join us for our next program.